I do have a message today for you, and I feel like the Lord has given me a burden, and I want to share it with you. Um, And so, basically, the thought that I have, and and I've looked around since the beginning of this year, and one of the things that I've seen is that uh, so many leaders in the church, and what I know of mostly is just a bunch of worship pastors that have been in the ministry have been struggling to finish the course. And... It began in January. I got a phone call from a friend that said, hey, one of our dear friends just stepped out of the ministry because of a moral failure. And so um, I just started thinking then, you know, Lord, what, what does it take for us to stay the course to finish strong? What would give us staying power? And so, because I think there are things that we can look at that would help us know what it means to have staying power. And, uh, and so... I've got four points today. I might slim it to three points if I need to kind of do that for time uh, because I do like to talk. My wife tells me, keep it short, Mark. And so she's here today, so you guys are in in, in good shape because she'll make sure that I don't keep you. Uh, It's usually a two-hour message, but it'll only be an hour and a half. You guys okay? I'm kidding. That's a joke. Uh, um, Anyway, um, uh, but my but the title of what I'm sharing today is staying power, and um, I want to go right to the first point, and that is, in order to have staying power, you have to show up and step in. And uh, I know that you you're halfway there because you're here this morning. So what have you done? You've shown up, right? <laughs> and and I've heard so many times from coaches that want their players to become better players. They say, hey, half of Half of winning the game is just showing up and being at practice. I think so many times for us, it's literally half of us moving ahead in life and being successful is just literally showing up. Um, And so I do want to read one of my life verses is Romans 12.1. And this is what it says in the New Living Translation version. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, and that's you guys, I plead with you, to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And so if you show up, the thing that you also need to do is you need to step in. You need to be willing to surrender your life and give your life. There's a story, and I love this story. It's one of my favorite stories because it's such a beautiful description of what surrender looks like. Back in the late 1700s, there was a a Scottish congregational church, and the the pastor was aging, and so he was meeting with the elders, and the elders were having a conversation with him about him stepping down. And the elders felt like he was pretty much out of step with where the, the church needed to go, and they were frustrated because they weren't having a lot of results. They were not seeing a lot of fruit. And so the elders were saying, hey, we think that it's time for us to find a new pastor. And so they were asking him for his resignation. And so the, the Scottish pastor said, well, hold on a second. He said, he said, there have been results. And they said, well, tell us of one salvation decision this past year that you can point to that would let us know that there have been any results. And so the Scottish pastor was pretty smart. He said, well, and so this is how he would have said it. There's a wee Bobby Muffet, okay? And so there was a little boy named Bobby. Okay, this is my attempt. My family's laughing at me, going, that's a bad Scottish accent. So I won't do that again. But so there was this little boy, and his name was, they called him Bobby. Okay, so Bobby was, uh, he'd been attending church, but he'd never committed his life to Christ. And so this Scottish pastor at this congregational church, he was preaching a sermon on missions. And so that day, At the end of his sermon, instead of giving an invitation, he said, today, instead of people coming to the altar, we're going to take an offering for missions. And so the ushers got to the back of the church, and so they, like ushers used to do, they they come forward and they pass the plate, and then they get it, and then they go to the next pew, and they pass the plate again. When they came to the pew that Bobby was sitting on, and he was sitting on the end, Bobby looked at the usher, and he said, will you place the plate on the floor? And the usher was like, well, what do you want me to pla- place the plate on the uh, uh, floor for? And, and so Bobby said, just place it on the floor. So the, the usher laid the plate on the floor, and little Bobby got out 
of where he was sitting on the end of the pew, and he stepped into the plate, and he said, I have no money to give. All I have to give is my life, but I give my life. Amen? It's a beautiful description of surrendering to Christ. Now, here's the story of Bobby. Bobby is Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat was the greatest evangelist that the continent of Africa had ever seen. Okay, years later, he and his wife went to South Africa, and not only did they evangelize, but what they did, they were so wise, they went in, and he knew how to basically to farm. He'd learned that in Scotland. And so he took all of his farming techniques to, to South Africa. And so he farmed the land. And basically what he did was he taught them how to feed themselves physical food. And then he taught them about Jesus so that they could be fed spiritually. He translated the Bible into their language. He's the one responsible for that. And he evangelized all of South Africa. Earlier this year, my wife Jody and I, we were in Cape Town, South Africa. And there are these lush orchards with all these grapes growing and just beautiful countryside and so many vibrant churches. And I couldn't help but believe that we were seeing some of the fruit that Robert Moffat had planted back in the early 1800s. And, and it all started with him being willing to just simply step into the plate. Like I said, half of it is showing up, but the biggest part is stepping in. And, you know, the reality is, is, is you can walk into a building called a church every weekend of your life. You can have friends there. You can have community there. But if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you're missing the most important thing. Because you have to, at some point, step in the plate. And today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that later on. Because I believe that if you don't surrender your life to Christ, then you're missing the most important thing. You're missing the greatest detail about coming into the building. So showing up and stepping in. Next, once you step in, the next point is you've got to stay in. So you've got to step in, but then you've got to stay in. And here's the thing. When I was a little boy, I was raised in a Pentecostal church in southwest Alabama. It was a crazy church. I mean, it was the kind they did run the aisles. that They were, you know... It was a very incredible Pentecostal church, but it was like backwoods Pentecostal. We didn't have snakes. We didn't do that, but it was Pentecostal. And so anyway, as a young boy at about seven years of age, I made a commitment to the Lord. I stepped in. But as I grew up, I didn't stay in, okay? Because as I got into my teen years, I pretty much rebelled and got out of the church, and I I started doing things that I knew weren't right. And then I went to a Christian college, and even there I, would do, I was doing things that weren't right. And I'll never forget it, 23 years of age, and this is interesting. So I went to Christian college, and I got out of college, and I had a degree in church music and a minor in theology, yet I, I wasn't living for the Lord. So it can be all around you, and, and, and you still aren't surrendered. And so here's the reality for Mark Harris. At 23 years of age, we were traveling around the world. I was in a group called Truth. Anybody ever hear of the music group Truth? You got to be, okay? Some of you did. So Jody and I were in the group Truth. And she wasn't, I didn't know her yet. It was later on that I met her. Um, but one night in a cold, like icy, snowy, like setting in Iowa, we were singing. And at the end of the service, the guy that was over Truth gave an invitation for people to accept Christ. And I was sitting on the platform in the group singing and evangelizing. We were an evangelizing group. So I was in this group and I realized it's like I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I don't know you. You have no relationship with me. And that night, my testimony is at 23 years of age, I went back to the host home that I was staying in. I got down beside my bed and I asked the Lord to come into my life and redeem me and restore me. And I, I basically repented of all the things that I'd done. And even after having been seven years old and stepping in, I, I'd not stayed in. Since that moment, I've stayed in. So the thing is, is there may be, be a point in time in your life when you've stepped in, but maybe you haven't stayed in. That was my story. And, and here's the reality. And, and I love Luke 9, 23, what it says then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple. 
must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. It's a daily thing. You know, it's interesting because when you look at um, the Lord's Prayer, He doesn't give us weekly bread. He doesn't give us monthly bread. He doesn't give us yearly bread. What does He give us? It's a daily thing. It's getting up every day and saying, God, today, afresh and anew, I commit my life to you. And I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what you have to say to me. He wants to be a part of everything we do. Earlier this year, um, Jody and I, we decided that we were going to, we made a, a, a pretty unique decision. We were going to try to take communion every morning. And, and so I, I, Jody were, and I were talking, and Jody just said, hey, I think we need to do this. And so um, at the end of December, we said, as soon as January 1 comes, we're going to, during our morning quiet time when we're praying and reading the Word, we're going to just come to the table of the Lord and take communion every morning that we can. And so um, anyway, so we started doing that. We started taking communion in the morning. Now, I'm not saying that this is something that you need to do, but we felt like the Lord just nudge us and say, you need this. And so our version of staying in this year in 2024 has literally been Jody and I beginning our mornings in the Word of God first. And then as we begin to pray, we come around his table and we grab a little grape juice and a little cracker and we take communion. And it's really interesting because... Um, we just started doing this, and every morning, Jody uh, and I would pray. And so I would pray for healing for my body. Now, I didn't know that I was sick. And so in January, I started praying for healing over my physical body and over Jody's body. And, uh, and so anyway, at the end of February, I found out that I had cancer. And so when you get that information from the doctor, it's very shocking. No one ever wants to hear that word, right? And so the doctor basically told me, Mark, um, we believe you have cancer. And, uh, and so they had to do a bunch of scans and praise God, they got all of the cancer. Amen. I'm cancer free, no cancer in my body. And then, but here's the beautiful thing. So after the operation, the doctor said, you'll still see cancer numbers in your blood. He said, everybody does because it's going to take a month or two for all of those numbers to, to regulate. A week after my surgery, they, they did blood work, and the doctor called and said, Mark, this is miraculous. You have no cancer markers in your blood at all. And so, let's praise God. So the thing is, is when, I, when I said that to Jody, Jody said, well, she said, you've been praying healing over your body since January. She said, I didn't know why, but every day we come to the table and we take communion. And she said, and you've been confessing healing over your body. Amen? So staying in is a good thing. Once you've stepped in, you have to remain in that place where every day, there's a, there's a time, and it may not be like what it looks like for Jody and I, but, but it's important to stay in the Word of God. It's important to stay in a place of prayer where you can speak to Him, but not only that, where you can hear Him speak to you. Amen? Amen? It's important because the thing is, is God wants His time with us. He's jealous over us. And the reality is, is I've learned more than hearing anybody else's voice speak to me. I want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, there's, there's so much clarity in that because God wants to give us his, his word over our lives. He wants to speak to us. And so it's important that we step in and that we stay in. Um, and I love this scripture. One of my favorite scriptures too is Philippians 1.6. God wants to speak to us because the work that he's doing in us it, it's a continual thing. He doesn't complete it the day that we step in. But there's a continual work that he's doing in our lives. And so I love this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God's not finished with you, but you have to be willing to stay in. There's a story, um, and it's the Chinese bamboo tree. And when Jody and I were in Asia a while back, 
we saw these real tall, like, it's just a big old shoot of bamboo, and it's about 100 foot tall. And so we saw that in, in all over Asia and Indonesia and, uh, and as well in Taiwan. And so how many of you have heard of a Chinese bamboo tree? Okay. Um, maybe you know the story, but this is a good story. For those of you that haven't heard, I'm going to tell you. So a farmer plants a seed uh, for, to, to grow a Chinese bamboo tree. So he puts the seed in the soil, okay? And he goes out and he waters that spot every day. Every morning that farmer goes to water the spot where he planted the seed. The first month goes by, nothing comes out of the ground. Half a year goes by, nothing comes out of the ground. A year goes by, nothing comes out of the ground. Two years go by, nothing comes out of the ground. Three years go by, still nothing comes out of the ground. Four years go by, nothing. Can you imagine people watching him if they don't know what, what he's actually doing? They wonder, why is that old man putting water on that dirt? Four years. And then the fifth year comes by, and all of a sudden, out of the ground grows this amazing tree that it shoots up in a matter of months, and it, it grows to 100 feet tall. Now, the thing that they say about the Chinese bamboo tree is that all the while, when you can see nothing above the surface, underneath, God is building through his amazing, like, the, the way that he creates, just building this incredible foundation for the tree so that when it grows quickly, 100 foot tall, it doesn't fall over. God knows that that tree needs that foundation. And when they dig up the roots, it's this huge root structure that's not only tall and long, but it's wide. I think that's the way it is for us most of the time. You see, we don't see things happening, but we, if we stay in, God's watering us. Amen? I mean, He's giving us what we need. If we stay in the, at the plate, just like that bamboo tree, God's doing his work in us. And even when we can't see the results, what he's doing is he's giving us the things that we need in the foundation of our life. So that when all of these things start to happen and we start to bloom, we can handle it. You know, so often I think that what happens sometimes with leaders that fall is they're not willing to stay in the place where God's watering them and growing the foundation that they need. And so they step out of that place because they get impatient. I think not just leaders, but I think all of us have a tendency to do that because we want to see results. But God doesn't want us to skip the process that he wants us to go through. Remember, he who begins the good work in us will be faithful to do what? But it's in his timing. So we have to be willing to stay in the plate. I love that story of the Chinese bamboo tree. Isn't that cool? You know, the reality is, is um, if we're willing to stay in, then the beautiful thing that happens in our lives is then when we show up, when you and I do, when we show up in the world around us, people see a difference in us. I think about, I think about me as a husband. Jody knows when I've not been with the Lord. You know, Jody knows when I haven't stayed in. My kids see when I haven't stayed in. The people I work with see it. What do people see when you show up? Like what version of you do they get? Because you see the reason that I ask that is because when we are born again, and I love this quote, and this is such a great quote, quote by a Jesuit priest. Literally he says, when you're born again, you are no longer a physical being having an occasional spiritual experience. When you're born again, you become a spirit being. Get this, having a physical experience. So that means that when you become a believer and a child of God, filled with the Spirit, you've stepped in and you're staying in, then no longer are you the same person that you were before because the physical being now is subjective to the spiritual being. Problem is, when we don't stay in, the physical being has a tendency to grow strong if we feed that mostly. And then all we give to our family, all we give to our, our friends, the people we work with, is just the physical version of ourselves. But the one that can bring about change is a spirit being. Amen? Amen? 
How many would say, you know what? I want them to see the Spirit being. I want them to see the Holy Spirit lived out in me. Amen? In order to do that, you have to stay in. Because who will show up if you don't do that is the other version of you. Um, there's, a, there's a scripture, and this is one of my favorites. Um, I, I love Psalm 1914 um, because every time that we would finish a chapel at the school that I went to as a Christian college, uh, this was our benediction. It's literally, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, my strength and my redeemer. We would pray that every day. It just kind of became something that rolled off of our tongue. So many mornings in, in my life as I'm driving to work and just, in, just when I'm alone, I have a tendency just to, to say that scripture because what I want people to see in me is, is the love of Christ. I want them to experience and encounter the Holy Spirit when they're around me. The only way you can do that is by being willing to stay in the plate so that when you show up, he shows up. And then the last thought that I have, and, that, and I love this thought, it's just, um, if you stay in the plate, then it's not just you that shows up. God will show up. Amen? And when God shows up, everything changes. The atmosphere changes. You know, you could notice in the room this morning as we leaned in and we pressed in to worship, you could feel the presence of God. Amen? I mean, you could feel like the atmosphere changes, something shifts. I mean, I've been in worship services before where it was just a list of songs and people did them, and you didn't feel anything. But if you begin to press in, staying in, and you begin to lift your voice and worship, if you begin to quote his scripture over your life, if you reach out and start praying and calling on his name, then what happens is God shows up. And when God shows up, so many incredible things come with that. Amen? <laughs> you get Jehovah Jireh. What is that? He is the provider. So if you lack provision, if you stay in and you wait on God to show up, then what you get is the provision that he has for you. Amen? And I don't know about you, but earlier this year, like I said, I needed, I literally just was praying, God, I need you, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. If you need healing, then you can. I mean, the, the reality is, is I've learned that I can't carry those things. I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I need the presence and the power of Almighty God. Amen? And then in all the chaos that we've been going through at Gateway, so many times I've said, God, I need your peace. Hey, when God shows up, Jehovah Shalom is there. Amen? And the reality is, is when God shows up, and this is the one I love the most, um, Jehovah Sabaoth, God of angel armies. Hey, you know something? God mentions himself as, as Jehovah Shalom. He mentions that one time in his word. Um, he mentions uh, Jehovah Jireh one time. He mentions Jehovah Rapha one time. In his word, almost 300 times, he refers to himself as, I am the God of angel armies. You want me to tell you what I think he's saying to us? Is there's not a battle you face that you can't win if I'm with you. And I think so often what we do is we're unwilling to wait on God. We get out of, of, the, of the plate and we start trying to do things in our own power and our own strength and all of a sudden, Jehovah Sabaoth, God of angel armies, is saying, you left me behind. Hey, we've been reading through the Old Testament, Jody and I have this year. How many times did his children leave him behind and go in their own strength to try to fight the battle? Every time. They got whipped. They got whipped. But every time they went with the God of angel armies, they had a victory. If you're trying to fight the battles of life, outside of being surrendered and staying in and waiting on the presence and the power of Almighty God, then you're, you're going about it wrong because God wants to fight the battles for you. I've learned in my life, and this is the thing that I've had to learn in ministry, is there are things that are weighty and too heavy for me to try to carry. 
only he can carry. But I find that in, sometimes in just my stubbornness as a human being, I want to try to carry those things. And all the while God is saying, Mark, I didn't call you to carry that. Matter of fact, he says in his word, he said, I want to trade your heaviness for my lightness. I want to take that yoke, that heavy burden, and I want to put it on my shoulders, and I'll give you mine because it's light. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you've been trying to carry that heavy burden on your own because you look at your circumstances. And, and it, hey, it's our human nature to get impatient. I'm impatient. I always want to get it done. I'm an activator. I am a ready, fire, aim guy. That's not good in Texas. Um, but, but I have learned that if I just wait on God, if I'm just willing to say, God, I wait on you. I wait on you. I want what you have for me. I want what you have because I know you know what's best. You know, um, I mentioned it earlier. We've been going through a lot at Gateway. And uh, we've kind of gotten to this place where we realize that we're not able in our own strength to move forward without God. We just, I mean, we, it's, it's clear to us. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt we are incapable of carrying this burden alone. And the weekend after everything had come out, um, as a staff and as leadership on that staff, we were having so many conversations, and we really didn't know what to do. And in all these conversations and meetings, um, we were talking about, well, what's the path forward? The only thing that we could come up with was we have to turn our eyes on Jesus. We have to look to him. We have to basically take every bit of our attention and focus it on him because he's the one that has the answers. So literally our posture was this, to say, God, you have our full attention. And it was like all we could do was say, God, we're stepping back into the plate. We're showing up and we're stepping in. And Lord, we're not going to leave this place until you speak. So it was just an act of saying, God, we've stepped in and we're staying in. But you know, I have a feeling today that some of you, it's not the same things that, that we're, the same thing that we're going through at Gateway, but maybe in your home and in your family, in your own personal life, maybe there's something that you are facing and it feels like it's just a mountain that you can't get over and or a circumstance or a situation that seems hopeless. And today I just pray that you hear the voice of the Lord say, hey, come to me, step in. And I want you to stay with me because I am God of angel armies, okay? <laughs> and if you will just stay right here and if you will turn your eyes to me, I'll carry you through this. But if you leave me, I can't help you. That's what God would say to you today is, come to me, step into the plate, stay in the plate, and I'll show up. How many of you want God to show up in your circumstances, in your situations? You know, I'm just going to ask you this morning, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come down, to come forward, and, uh, and we're going to have a ministry time today. There's enough time to do that. And one of the things I learned over the past few weeks, and I've learned it's just sometimes we hurry through this. But this is where God wants to commune with us. And if you just want to come down and kneel, we're going to sing a little bit. And during this time, it's just a time for us to come. And maybe, maybe you want to walk down here and just simply repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've stepped out of the plate. I'm sorry that I've walked away from you. I'm sorry that I didn't stay in. Or maybe you just need to come down and say, God, what I'm facing in my family is bigger than I can handle. Lord, today I need to give it to you and I need the God of angel armies to show up. Or maybe you just need to say, God, I need Jehovah Rapha right now. I need you to show up. Or maybe it's provision for your family and you're facing a situation you just don't know how to get through it. You need Jaira to show up. He's here. He's here. Amen. Don't you believe that? He's here. Amen. And so as Jess sings this, I just want you just to step out. If you want to just come and kneel down, we'll just take a little time in the presence of the great I am. Amen. 
Because the great I am says, whatever you need, you step up to my table. And there's sufficiency there. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for your presence. Lord, I thank you for the simple fact that, Lord, if we just, (laughs) if we show up, Lord, and we're willing to step in and surrender, and Lord, to stay in until you move, God, you show up. And when you show up, God, there is not a need that you can't meet. There's not a battle that you can't win. Lord, there's not a disease that you can't heal. Lord, there's not a provision or a need that you can't meet. You're that great. God, there's not an addiction that you can't break. Lord, there's not a a bondage or an attack from the enemy that you can't send, send off and fleeing from us, Lord, because you're that great. So right now, God, we just pray, Lord, that you would have your way over these people, God, that you would move, God, that you would just come in the power and might that you have, God, and that you would just, as a great I am, come and move. We ask that right now, Lord Jesus, as we turn our eyes on you, as we turn our eyes to you.